Due delay, I will put the microphone before him. And his topic today is destruction of Iman. And inshallah, we will benefit from it. Great Abdul Mashkur. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحابه ومن استنى بالسنة يوم الدين. Indeed, all praise due to Allah and may Allah all peace and blessings be on the last Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and on all those who follow his path until the last day. The official topic on the uh, schedule is the wasting of wealth, I think, Ibad and Mal. But this is only a small, because within the overall framework of Iman, that this represents one of the areas by which Iman is destroyed. So, rather than take that one particular topic by itself, I decided instead to cover the overall picture of what destroys Iman. Over the last three days, we've been looking at the things which strengthen Iman, different aspects of Iman, things related to Iman. So, just as a closing, this being the last lecture, uh, I decided to uh, tackle the issue of the destruction of Iman. Not from the point of view of the specific things, you know, which are they call nawaqid al-Iman, right? Like shirk and these specific topics which have been identified and they have been covered over these days. But from the point of view of Shaitan, the enemy, who in fact is behind all of the various uh, practices, beliefs, ideas, etc., which ultimately end up destroying Iman. So, and this thought also came to me because of a question which was raised. Uh, last night in last night's panel session where somebody you know had this big problem and I know this is a problem which is raised in many circles this in the North American context amongst those who don't believe or why they don't believe in God I mean they usually come at the believers from the point of view of uh, why there is evil in the world. You know, Satan has become symbolic. And the issue still remains, why is there evil? The big question, if God is all-powerful, then he could create a world without evil. And if God is all-good, then he only wants good for his creatures. So, therefore, the world should have no evil. But since there is evil, that means that there couldn't be a God. Or God is not all-powerful. Which is in fact means they really don't have God. Because God is all-powerful. This is a question. This is the basic element of the, the doubt and the confusion which is in the minds of the atheists. Those who doubt about God's existence. You know, this is usually what is first thing that is raised, why is there evil? So, the Islamic system is quite clear on the issues of evil and why there is evil. So this is why I felt it was good to tackle this topic in more depth, look at it uh, and its implications in more depth. So, in beginning, what we're looking at first and foremost, we look at the wisdom behind the creation of Iblis, of Satan. I touched on it briefly last time, we'll look at it in more detail now. And then we look at 
the battle. The battleground which we, I spoke of earlier being the heart of the human being, the struggle between his desires and the religion and wisdom and uh, reason. And the main enemy in the whole struggle, in the struggle of Iman is Satan, Shaitan and his allies. This is the struggle. Ibad rahman and Ibad shaitan Now, the first thing that is important for us to realize, because this is something which people I heard mentioning also in last night's lecture and previously, as to what was the sin which Iblis did for Allah to say about him, كَانَ مِنَ الْكَافِرِينَ He was a kafir. What is it that Iblis did that made him a kafir? Now, people mistakenly think that it is his disobedience refusal to bow to Adam. This is commonly what most people think. Actually, this is the position of the Khawarij. This is the position of the Khawarij. That if you disobey Allah in a clear commandment of Allah, then you become a kafir. This is not the belief of Ahl Sunnah. Very important point. It is not the belief, and as I'm saying to you, I'm sure most of you are believing, you came here sitting down thinking that the reason why Satan became a kafir was because he refused to bow to Adam when Allah commanded him to bow to Adam. But this is not true. That, I said, is the belief of the Khawarij. Their belief that they say, Murtakib uh, al-Kabair, مخلد في النار and those who commit major sins major disobedience of Allah become among the denzians of hell they will be in hell forever that's it that is the belief of the khawarij and after them also the mu'tazila they carry this belief now on the other hand if we look at what happened, we find actually the root of Iblis's disbelief in his statement, Ana khairun minhu. I am better than him. You created me, khalaqtani min narin, wukhalaqtahu min You created me from fire, and you created him from clay. In this statement, Iblis is addressing or putting on Allah dhulm. This is where the kufr lies. Because he is saying I am not supposed to bow to Adam. Your commandment to me to bow to Adam is not correct. Because I am better than him. And naturally the one who is better should not be bowing to the one who is inferior. This is where the kufr lies. And this is something that the Muslim ummah is muttafaq alayh. They are all agreed that anyone who attributes zulm or oppression to Allah has become a disbeliever. That is a statement of disbelief. I mean, a person might say it accidentally. Right? Okay, that doesn't mean just the words coming out makes you a disbeliever. Okay? Accidentally, okay? You may not really feel that once a person stops, you say, hey, listen what you're saying. You say, oh, no, no, I don't mean this. Okay, fine. But the person really, yes. And this is the point of Iblis. It wasn't just an accident. This is his position. He's standing by it. 
He's insisting on it. He's refusing. So in doing so, he is attributing oppression to Allah. And this is where the kufr is. And this is where he now gets cursed till Yom al Qiyamah. The basis of it, of course, is pride and jealousy. Right? Pride in himself, which then led to jealousy. He is jealous of human beings whom Allah has put on a higher station and required of him to bow. And of course that bowing was not a bowing of worship. You should be clear on that. You know, because of course the Sufiya, there are elements amongst the Sufi movement, you know, who went to the extreme, people like Al-Hallaj, who claimed that Iblis was in the right. Actually, he was a muwahid. He was, you know, an ultimate monotheist. Because he refused to bow to anything beside Allah. You see, Al-Hallaj, you know, very famous saint amongst the modern uh, Sufis, this was his claim. He said, he claimed in his writings, his poetry he wrote, in which he said that my teachers were Pharaoh and Iblis. You know, he only admitted it. His teachers were Pharaoh and Iblis. And why? Because Iblis refused to bow to anything beside Allah, and Pharaoh refused to accept that he was anything but Allah. Because what was Halaj's famous statement? An al haq I am the embodiment of truth. I am Allah. When he was taken before the court to be tried, in a Muslim court, and asked to recant his statement of saying, An al haq right? And Allah says, Wahu al haq Allah describes himself as al haq We know it's one of his names, Abdul Haq, we take these names. So when somebody says, An al haq I am al haq what is he saying? I am Allah. So when they brought him before the tribunal and he was asked to recant this, he stood up, opened up his cloak and said, there is nothing inside of this cloak except Allah. So they cut off his head. And he became for the Sufis among their saints, their highest saints. But the point here, the point here is that the bowing which was required or prostration which was required of Iblis was not one of worship as Allah calls on the angels to bow, prostrate actually what it is, you know, before Adam. That prostration was one of takrim, of honor honoring, recognizing the honor of that individual the status of that individual this is what Allah required of them but this was cancelled for human beings it was required of the angels and Iblis who happened to be amongst them due to knowledge which was given to him it was required of them recognizing Because they had doubt. They had doubt initially about Allah's creator, creation of Adam. Right? Remember in Surah Al-Baqarah, when Allah said He's going to create in the earth, a Khalifa and they asked, Are you going to create somebody who's going to spill blood and, you know, confusion? So Allah said, No. You don't, you, I know what you don't know. That this individual who I'm creating, Though he will have free will like the jinn who did spill blood and create confusion before him, he is on a higher level. And he demonstrated it with having them him tell them their names. And he had them bow. Bow in recognition of his superiority. The superiority of Adam. That Adam and human beings who follow the teachings of Allah become higher than the angels 
Of course, those who don't become lower than the animals. Right? So, the point of disbelief of Iblis was that of attributing oppression, dhulm. And Allah says, وَلَا يَظْلِمُ رَبُّكَ أَحَدًا And Allah does not oppress anyone. That is to say, to, to attribute dhulm to him is to cancel that. To say he's not telling the truth. It's false. That attribution of dhulm is the essence or the basis of Allah referring to him as a kafir. A disbeliever. Now, <clears throat> having understood that, the next point to look at is the wisdom behind the creation of Iblis. When Allah's complete knowledge indicate that he knew in creating Iblis that Iblis would disobey him attribute this uh, error to himself would uh, refuse would be kicked out of heaven he would enter in, into the uh, company of Adam and Eve and trick them and get them to disobey him and they would be kicked out of heaven all and end up on the earth and he would be at human beings from the left and the right above and below till the last day when Allah knew all of that why did he create a belief? this is the question now to understand why Allah created Iblis? We first need to understand that good only becomes a reality with the existence of its opposite. Good only becomes complete and real with the existence of its opposite. There's a famous statement that Arabic scholars quote in this regard. They say, وَبِضِدِّهَا تَتَمَيَّزُ الْأَشْيَا The piece of a line of poetry. Things become distinct by knowing their opposites. What is sweet if you don't know sour? What is light if you don't know darkness? the reality that all things only make sense with their opposite all of the created things we know them that way hot what is hot if you've never experienced cold what is up if you don't know what is down up is only up in relationship to down. See, all of these things have this relative nature to it, that you only know a thing by its opposite. So, good can only become real and complete with the existence of evil. That's the first point. The second point is that El Allah may wish something for itself for that, that thing for itself in and of itself as it is or he may wish something a goal while not being pleased with the means for the fulfilling of that goal that is he may wish something for itself or he may wish something for 
the goals which are achieved by it. Meaning, for example, and I, I gave this before last night, something desirable for its end, but in and of itself it is not desirable. You have cancer in your foot, and the doctor says, if we don't cut off your foot, the cancer will spread to the rest of your body and you will die. So cutting off your foot in and of itself is not a pleasant thing, not something pleasing to you. But living is something pleasing. So for that greater end of living, you will suffer the harm of getting your foot cut off. So the cutting off the foot, though it is evil in and of itself, the ends that come from it is good. So that thing is done for the ends, not for the thing itself. Important basic concept to grasp. Similarly, for example, you're going on a, a long journey. You know, you want to get to a particular place. You want to get to Mecca. Now to get to Mecca, well these days it's not so much of a problem, you get on a plane, you fly into Jeddah, you know, you're there. But in the old days, you know, if you lived in Algeria and you wanted to get to Mecca, or you lived in Nigeria and you wanted to get to Mecca, this was the journey of a lifetime. You had to pack all your belongings, you gave farewell to your family, because maybe you would never come back. That was it. It was going to take you months or years to get there. That journey. An arduous journey. But the goal, because of what was at the end of the journey, you set out on that journey, not for the journey. The difficulties of the journey, you're not pleased with that. You're not seeking that. What you're seeking is Mecca. To be able to go and make your Hajj. That is the goal. So you will undergo those difficulties, those unpleasant uh, circumstances for the purpose of the goal, what those things will lead to. So, when Allah created Iblis, who basically is a means for corruption and a cause of wretchedness in his creation. His creation is for the good which is achieved by his activity, not for he for himself. Not for himself. Allah is not pleased with the disobedience of Satan. But in his disobedience and in the evil which he got involved in, great good came out. Great benefits came out of it. For example, when Allah created Iblis, who then became a focus of evil in the world, he also created Jibreel, who is a focus of goodness in the world. These are opposites. You know? And this is part of the overall creation of op opposites, which Allah, in His greatness, that everything that we find around us, there are opposites. We find disease and we find cure. We find life and we find death. All of these point to the greatness of Allah and His, and His control over the whole creation itself. Secondly, in the creation of Iblis and the evil which came from him, Allah's opposition to that evil, His control over it, His overcoming it, in it is manifest His attributes of 
his overwhelming attributes his attributes like al-qahar al-muntaqim shadid al-iqab al-khafid al-mudhil all of these different attributes of Allah which indi- which deal with the evil which overcomes that evil which punishes that evil you know which lowers it in spite of its apparent power to us etc these uh, these attributes of Allah are manifest in that in the existence of that evil similarly on the other side are manifest his gentle attributes the attributes of kindness al-kareem al-halim all of these attributes al-rahim these attributes of kindness and of gentleness you know these become manifest again in the presence of this evil that for example in spite of the fact that people may commit shirk me people may do wrong Allah still in His kindness, in His mercy, He still allows them to function in the world. He still provides for them in spite of it all. No, his mercy is there. His kindness is there. His forgiveness is there. When people due to the evil influence, they disobey Allah and they fall into shirk and all these different things. And they seek repentance, they seek his forgiveness, then his attributes of forgiveness are manifest, of repentance. And what we find is that uh, Prophet Muhammad had said, is a well known authentic hadith found in Sahih Muslim, by the one in whose hand is my soul, if you didn't sin, if you didn't sin as human beings, Allah would have removed you and brought a people who would sin ask Allah's forgiveness and he would forgive them because in our sinning and turning back to Allah seeking his forgiveness his attributes of forgiveness become manifest We can also find in the creation, in the creation of evil, that his powers, his, the powers of creating miracles in the world become manifest. For the messengers that came, if there wasn't evil where people would disbelieve the messengers and struggle against the messengers, there would have been no need for miracles. The miracles were there to challenge that evil, to prove that these were prophets of God. So in this, that struggle, in the presence of the evil, struggling with the good and the prophets, is manifest the miracles of Allah. The splitting of the Red Sea. The splitting of the moon for Prophet Muhammad Turning of Moses' stake into uh, snakes. Is, uh, the Prophet Isa and the different miracles of Prophet Isa bringing the dead back to life. All of these things, these are miracles. All of these miracles become manifest in that struggle with evil. Remove evil from the picture, they're gone. All of these miracles have no relevance. So it is the wisdom of Allah in allowing that evil to grow that is manifest this greater good. This, uh, the miracles which then led to the belief of people who had fallen into disbelief or had fallen into shirk etc this brought them into guidance and we find also with the evil the existence of evil Iblis and his supporters we also find a variety of forms of worship which take place of Allah 
in his creation. That worship taking place as a result, a direct result of that evil. Whether it is fear of the believers, the fear of falling into sin, and fear is a form of worship. Or it is the act of repentance that we spoke about earlier. Or it is their submission to Allah and rejection of the satanic invitation all of these acts of worship become manifest in response to the evil the jihad one of the highest forms of worship the jihad becomes real when there is a struggle when there are those who oppose that evil element opposes the believers and draws them into struggle whether it's Western civilization of today, or whether it is Rome and Persia, or the pagan Meccans of the past, all of these instigated jihad, that there would be martyrdom, there would be those who would give up their lives for the sake of Allah, the highest sacrifice. Commanding the good, and prohibiting the evil about which Allah says that we are the best of humankind for how do you command the good if all is good how do you prohibit the evil if there is no evil it has to be there for these acts and these are acts of worship we worship Allah by commanding the good and prohibiting the evil seeking refuge in Allah why would we need to seek refuge in Allah if there is no evil there is no seeking refuge the surahs, the last surahs of the Qur'an, the Mu'awadatan, these are revealed, why? To seek refuge in Allah. From what? From Satan. The evil produced by Satan. And also, the means of distinguishing between good and evil, separating from the believers, separating out those who are true believers, those who are false, you know, the different, this weeding out, the sifting process, this is done through the trials in this world produced by the evil. So, if we go back to the general uh, concept again, going back to Adam, and Eve and Iblis we can say that though Allah was not pleased he was displeased by Adam's eating of the tr from the tree instigated by Satan he was pleased with his repentance his submission and his humility to Allah that repentance submission humility is greater the good of it is greater than the evil of disobedience to Allah by eating from the tree. Also, Allah was not pleased with Prophet Muhammad being driven out of Mecca. There was something displeasing to Allah. However, he was pleased by his triumphant return. But that triumphant return cannot take place unless he was driven out. So, one produced the other. One is displeasing to Allah, but the other is greatly pleasing to Allah. So, always when we look at the good and the evil, we understand it in this context. That evil is necessary for the completeness of good. We can say in general, that nothing, because we go back to the idea, isn't Allah good? So what comes from Him is still supposed to be good. The point is that Allah does not create anything, nor allow anything, which does not have an aspect of good to it. 
It will appear evil to us from this side, that side, the other side, but there will be a good side to it. Whether we can grasp it, we can see it, it becomes obvious to us or not. Allah does not create pure evil. Allah does not intend evil for His creatures. He does not have an evil intention. Human beings... And the jinn, they have been given the ability to have an evil intent. So they can implement or attempt to implement what we can call pure evil. They have an evil intent and when they do that act, it is an evil act, pure, relative to that human being. But still... For Allah to allow it to take place, because again, we can intend all we want. But it cannot happen unless Allah permits it to happen. So Allah permits it to happen because there is an aspect of good in it. So in the end, it all comes back to Allah being good. And whatever he has created is good. In that ultimate sense. But to achieve that good, an element of evil was permitted. So if we go back to our original formula, which the atheist raised, that God is good. You say yeah. And God is all powerful we say yes but their conclusion that since he's all powerful he should have made a world with no evil we say no who are you to say he should who are you to say he should no we say he made a world which was good but that a portion of that good was produced through evil which he permitted and our formula is acceptable it takes into account the existence of evil now we need to look at the basic battle Allah tells us in Surah Al-Isra, verse 53, Inna shaytana kana lil insani adu wan mubina. Indeed, certainly, Satan is a clear enemy for human beings. Allah uses the past tense here. Kana. He was. If you turn translated it literally, he was a clear enemy. But no. That is an element of, of eloquence in Arabic, which is talking not just of the past. His, his enmity, his being the enemy, is so complete. This is why by, by Allah using the, using the past tense is, is indic showing its completeness, the completeness of his enmity. It's past, present, and future to the end of this world. And that enmity began, of course, we know, with Adam and Hawa. He whispered to them, he swore Qasamahuma Inni Lakuma Lamina Nasihi. He swore to them that I am a good advisor to you. And then he played on what? On their whims and desires. He told them, Your Lord has only forbidden you from this tree 
so that you would not become angels or eternal beings. This is the only reason. So he's put that thing in their heart, of course. The desire to be eternal, to not die, though they're in a state where the issue of death has not come, but it is part of our nature to want to live forever. This is part of our nature. So, he played on that. And we have human beings. They're, they're, today, they're caught up in it. I just saw a program on uh, when I was on the airplane. They had this news program, Discovery Channel. And they were talking about cyrogenics. Right? This thing was developed from back in the 50, 60s and so on and so forth. This thing, the idea of freezing the body when you die. When you die, people are paying thousands and thousands of dollars. And they showed the process how when you die, they take out all your blood, they put in some antifreeze, and they put you in, in, in these um, containers in liquid nitrogen, you know, keeping your body at like, you know, uh, a few degrees away from absolute zero. Right? Where all activity in your body is going to stop moving. The idea is that a hundred years from now or whatever, when they science now reach the point they can take you out, thaw you out you know, and make you right again, you'll be up and running again and people are paying thousands of dollars, they got centers in the states, different places paying thousands and thousands of dollars for this if you can't afford the full treatment right, then they will freeze your head <laughs> right they just keep your head because it doesn't require as much you know, space container space so they'll freeze your head why? because of this belief that really who are we? we are the product of our brains you know we're like a computer you know whatever is in the brain there that's us right? so they'll freeze your brain until such time comes that they've developed cloning to the point where they can develop a new body for you you know then they'll download your brain into that new body and you're up and running again brand new body you know this is the belief delusion a delusion but it's part of the desire to want to live forever how many billions of dollars are spent trying to stop what they call the aging process the clock the biological clock they're trying to get to it and stop it so you can just live on and the cloning you see when you look into much of the cloning there's an element of cloning which is good, useful, you know, developing certain uh, uh, human uh, enzymes and things which can help in ailments that we have, producing it in a simpler way, this type of thing. This is good, but there is this other evil element where most of the money is being spent, where the intention is to be able to recreate yourself. So they can take a cell from your body stimulated in the womb of the of a woman and produce a child which is you so they grow that body up so when your body starts to run down you need spare parts you can got a body you can take spare parts change your heart change your this and change that or ultimately to download yourself into this new body this is their evil intent and of course they will fail they will fail because that body is not you they may, they may be able to clone individuals taking cells as possible. They've shown it on certain levels and we're not going to stand and say it can never happen. No. It could happen. They could take a cell from your body and put it with an ovum and produce somebody who is genetically very similar to you. But it's not you. Because when the angel brings the soul at the beginning of the fifth month, it's not your soul. Your soul is already in your body. It's another person. That one who comes alive is not you. That's another human being. And that's why their plan can never succeed.
succeed. It can never succeed. It is an evil plan and it is an ancient plan. What were the pharaohs doing? Same thing. The mummies of Egypt. It was the same idea. The idea with we're going to live on. You know, they even took slaves and killed the slaves and buried them in, in, the, in the pyramids along with the pharaohs, thinking that when they get up and start running in, they're going to need slaves. So they <laughs> had the slaves along with them. And their animals, their cats and their things. And yes, these people were freezing, they're freezing their cats too. And their dogs. Same mentality. And that's what Satan played on in the human soul. And they fell for it. And they disobeyed Allah and ate. They forgot Allah, ate, but the difference is that when they ate and their garments which shielded them were removed, they immediately tried to cover themselves up, which speaks towards the basic nature of the human being in wanting to cover himself or herself which this society here opposes tooth and nail that this is really a psychological disorder that people want to cover themselves and to be shy no you should be proud that's what the nudist colony it's it's evil it's against the very nature of the human being And that nature is manifest there. And what did they do? They turned back to Allah in repentance. And Allah forgave them. Difference again, this is difference in the natures of the jinn and the human beings. When you compare Adam and Iblis. Iblis makes his mistake, but he hangs on to it. He's going to fight Allah all the way. The human being, he makes his mistake. He turns back to Allah in repentance. And Allah forgives him. And that's what makes him superior. Even though the powers of Iblis, the powers of the jinn, are greater than human powers. Their abilities are greater. But as a race, or as a you know, set of creatures, they are inferior to human beings. Then, when they were cast out of heaven on the earth again Satan came back to them and caused them to commit another error there was another error the error of shirk in the name of their child as the scholars of Tafsir explain when Eve became pregnant and she was going to give birth child is developing within her then Satan came back to her and told her that maybe your child will turn out to be a cow or a dog you know, or a cat or a lizard but if you want him to turn out to be nice and looking like you then name him Abdul Hadith because that was his other name Al-Harith this was the other name of Satan Iblis they refused and the child died she got pregnant again and he came back again they refused and the child died and that repeated itself enough times that finally when he came to them and they couldn't see any other way they named, they agreed to name their child Abdul Haris and the child was born that was the one, the other name for Cain or Qabil but in naming that child that this was, this was shirk that they committed but it was not the elemental shirk of worshipping others besides Allah it was shirk in the naming of the child and that child we know ended up killing its brother 
Abel, Habil. And that was the major sin committed amongst human beings after coming to the earth. Cain killing Abel. And when Cain killed Abel, he killed him out of what? Jealousy. The same thing which led Iblis to disobey Allah. And this is why jealousy is a major evil. A characteristic which the believer has to fight tooth and nail. Jealousy. Al Hasad. So much so that we have in Surah Al Nas to seek refuge in Allah. I'm oh, sorry, from Surah Al Falaq. Seek refuge in Allah. Min Hasidin Ida Hasad. From it. The evil eye, which is Haq, as the Prophet said. The essence of it is jealousy. So, jealousy caused disobedience in the heaven, the major defeats disobedience, and jealousy caused disobedience on earth. So we know that this is a major sin that we have to be aware of. Now, with Cain, of course, killing Abel, Prophet Muhammad said, for every soul killed unjustly, the first son of Adam carries a portion of the sin for the blood spilled because he was the first to murder. As the Prophet ﷺ said, Man sanna sunnatan Whoever begins an evil way, they will carry the sin of everyone who follows that evil way until the last day. Without decreasing the responsibility of the sin of those who commit it. So this is the struggle. This is the struggle that we're faced with. And of course murder, as we said, is one of the biggest elements of evil produced by Satan. So the wars the fitna which comes out of the wars, this is the, this is the greatest uh, success that he achieves. And Abu Musa described a situation from the Prophet ﷺ saying that every morning Iblis sends out his troops saying to them, whoever misguides a Muslim, I will give him a crown to wear. And one of them will say, when he comes back, he will say, I remained with so-and-so until he divorced his wife. Shortly after marrying her. And another one will say, I stuck with so-and-so until he was disrespectful and bad to his parents. Though he was about to do good. And he will say, Another will say, I stuck with so and so until I got him to drink alcohol. And Satan is nodding to all of this. And then someone would say, I, sorry, when, when, when he says this, Satan would say, right on, you're the one. And when somebody would say, I stuck with so and so until they fornicated, he would say, you're also one of my close allies and then someone will say I stuck with so and so until he murdered so and so and he will say you you are the one so this is the great trial and Prophet ﷺ had also warned us besides this element this evil uh, which Satan produces in the world he warned us of the marketplace saying in the hadith narrated by Salman the Farisi if you are able don't be the first to enter the marketplace nor be the last to leave it for it is the battleground of Satan where he raises his flag 
This is in Sahih Muslim. The battleground of Satan. Ida'at al-mal, wastage of wealth. People going into the marketplace and wasting their money. And Allah said, Inna al-mubadzirina kanu ikhwan al-shayateen wa kan al-shaytanu li rabbihi kafura. And indeed those who waste their wealth amongst the brethren of the devils and Satan was a disbeliever in his Lord we waste our money whether it is spending all kinds of money people are getting married you spend all kinds of money on the, on the, uh, the, the wedding procedures the walima all the money that is spent wasting the food that is wasted Or within our homes, the money that we waste on this and on that, all the different things we don't really need in our homes, when in the end, all of that is on our scale of evil deeds. The marketplace is a place we should try to avoid. At the same time, the people of the marketplace, the traders, what is common amongst the sort traders? They cheat, they deceive, they lie, you know. It's, it's a place of evil. This is why we're encouraged not to go there, to seek refuge when we enter there. It is a place of evil. It should be, we should deal with the marketplace like the way we deal with the toilet. You don't go there and spend all your day there. You go there when you need to go. You go and you get out. And that's how the marketplace should be dealt with. Now, the battle itself. That battle, Satan attacks us in three basic ways. Okay. Yeah, we're gonna delay the answer uh, to 6:20. Okay, to just try to try to finish off the topic. Because uh, actually, I'm only halfway through, but I'm gonna just try to sum up at least in the next 20 minutes or 25 minutes the remainder. The methods, the methods of Satan. That battle. How does he destroy our faith? Our Iman. The first method is the creation of doubts. They call tashkik. The creation of doubts. And the biggest doubt, of course, that they can create, that the satanic forces can create, is the doubt in Allah's existence. That's the biggest create, doubt they can create. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Satan will come to one of you and say to you, Who created the tree? And you, of course you'll say Allah. Who created the mountains? Who created the rivers? Allah. And then he will say, And who created Allah? The Prophet ﷺ said, When this comes, you seek refuge in Allah from shaitan and just drop it from your mind. Carry on. This is the doubt. And of course, Western civilization is a product, a clear product of this doubt. Their materialism, their secular democracy is based on this doubt. There is no God. Satan is mutamakkin, as they say in Arabic. He has got his feet dug in to Western civilization. They are right behind his whip. They are just promoting materialism, cross materialism in the rest of the world. Evolution. What is evolution about? There is no God. What is democracy? There is no God. So he is firmly established. And that's what's coming at our societies today.
The second area of doubt, major doubts, is the doubt concerning worshipping Allah alone, which has led to idol worship, idolatry. This is a major deviation. One, this, this, uh, denying God's existence altogether, that's total loss. But the other one, people actually believing in God, but they're not worshipping God anymore. Christians, that's them. Idolatry. They think they're worshipping Allah. Say, uh, Christmas is the biggest trick that Satan has played on the Christians. They are believing that God was born on the 25th of December. This is, this is loss. This is ignorance. They are lost. And they are worshipping a man. Believing that he is God. And they will argue with you. God can do anything. Can't he become a man? If he can do anything. In Allah ala kulli shayin qadir. We have to say yes. This is they say. You believe that, don't you? It's in your book. So why can't he become a man if he wants to? Well, we say, on one hand, if you're going to open that door that God can become a man, then why do you stop there? Can't he become a cow like the Hindus say? He's a cow. Or a statue like these other people say, whatever. Or a monkey or an elephant or anything. Wait, what? no, 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 no. Or why just one man? Why not many men? You know, the Hindus have the avatars. They have God men who show up every so often, right? Where do you, where do you draw the line? Because once you open that door, you can't close it. And in any case, as we point out, as Allah has shown us, that he cannot become man because if he became man then he would no longer be God he is the creator not the creation he creates what he has created needs him needs a creation creator so if he became the creation he is no longer the creator so when we talk about God is able to do all things, we don't include in it the absurdities, the things which will make God no longer God. Because again, as you said, God can do all things. He can become a man. You can say, can he become a mosquito and you can catch him? Can he die? Yeah. See, you, you've opened that door. No. You have to close that door. God is God and man is man. God can never be man and man can never be God. But that is the doubt that has come in their minds that Jesus, because of the miracles which he did, etc., is God. And they've ended up worshipping other than Allah, believing that they're actually worshipping Allah. And of course, the whole issue of idols, where they came from, we have mentioned in the Quran uh, five names, Wad, Suwa, Yahuth, Ya'uq, and Nasr. And the Prophet ﷺ explained that these were people in the time of Prophet Nuh, who were righteous people. In the time when the Quran was revealed, they were idols which were worshipped. But in the time of Prophet Nuh, they were the names of five righteous people amongst the people of Prophet Noah. When they died, Satan came to them and suggested to the people that they make images of these righteous people who died and place these images in the places where they used to gather with people. And the people did that. They placed the images in the different places where they used to have lectures or where they taught people with the graveyard etc. and in that time whenever people used to come by and they saw the image to remind them 
these were righteous people we should do righteousness so that there was apparent good there however generations later after those people died out Satan again came to their descendants and told them actually your four parents were worshipping these images and it is due to the worship of these images that the rain came that the crops were good and those descendants began to worship the images this is Satan creating the doubts the third level is creating doubts with regard to the pillars of faith pillars of Iman, pillars of Islam people who deny the angels for example or they deny the jinn the world of the jinn or they deny Satan this is part of our faith they deny the prophets yeah people will say yeah we believe in God we don't believe he sent any prophets we don't believe he talked communicated with human beings they call them deists God created the world and let it carry it on by itself no need for him to get involved but in the end what does it mean? it means we can make up our own religion each person has their own individual religion you worship God as you feel like misguidance and out of this came all of the major sects the different groups which broke away from Islam either they broke away from Islam uh, uh, claiming that there was another prophet after Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu like Mirza Ghulam Ahmed India, Pakistan the Ahmadis, Qadianis or the Baha'is from Baha'u'llah who claimed that he was the shadow of God on earth or Elijah Muhammad in America who claimed that he was Allah's messenger to the black man of North America and that Allah was a black man and that all black men are Allah's and that white people are devils and this is the teaching of Farrakhan and I heard recently people say that he took his shahada but every two years or so the same story comes along and it's just repeated over and over again and his people still talk about Elijah and Elijah's false teachings he's the Dajjal and we have also the creating of doubts in general where Muslims end up innovating in their religion because of doubts for example the niya before prayer niya before we do things in al amal bin niyat general instruction of Prophet Muhammad deeds are by their intentions from that people evolved a practice where when the time comes for prayer they're standing up before they make their takbir they stand there and they have a big long thing to say inni nawaitu an usalliya arba raka'atin muqtadiyan bil iman salatu zuhur all this stuff where did it come from? bidah innovation based on the doubt in intention why are they doing this? the intention is good they're saying because I want to make sure my intention is right but hey brother when you went to the to the, to the place to make wudu what were you making wudu for? you didn't know what you were making wudu for? you came to make wudu for salat al-dhuhr or salat al-asr your intention is there already you don't have to your intention is there in your heart you don't have to stand there and go through this big long story are you telling Allah something he doesn't know? and then the satanic forces come into our salah we're praying how many units of prayer did you make? you're not sure you're third or you're on the fourth or you're on the second or you're what? part of it is due to the fact that we're praying too quickly we're coming in not praying slowly and properly the way the Prophet Muhammad did but we come in we're trying to get through it get through it quickly so you lose track shaitan helps to lose track and he will mess you up about your wudu when you're in salah you make wukua and you feel something by your behind you think something slipped out right? <laughs> so you have to get out and go make your wudu again Prophet Muhammad said 
that is a particular jinn, evil jinn that comes in the salah by the name of khinzib right? who will blow on your behind when you bend over give you that feeling right? messing you up that's trying to jam up your prayers so he said if you didn't smell anything you didn't hear anything then just carry on with your prayer now some people mistakenly think that if you pass wind and you don't smell anything and you don't hear anything you can carry on no please don't misunderstand this here now no if you know you passed wind you better get out of that salah you don't have wudu go make your wudu you cannot pray without wudu this is only where you feel your stomach gurgles or something like this and you don't know did something slip out you say, this, okay if you didn't smell you didn't hear carry on and wudu many times brothers maybe move forward people are coming here. many times people come to me and they tell me you know I try I'm not making wudu I get halfway through my wudu and I can't remember did I do my elbow did I leave it dry and so they're making wudu over and over and over again or people they take the water and say, is this water pure can I smell something in this water? You know, all this kind of doubts that come to them, so they can't even complete wudu, hardly to get to the salah. You know, wudu becomes such a trial for them, prayer becomes a burden. You know, this is how shaitan comes and messes people up, even in the area of wudu. And there is a narration from Ubay ibn Ka'b in which he said, Inna lil wudu is shaitanan. lahu al walhan. That for wudu, there is another devil by the name of Walhan فَاتَّقُوا وَسَاوِسْ الْمَاء so beware of the whisperings concerning water know it then in the general category of doubts shaitan comes and messes with people with regards to the honor of other Muslims we know Prophet ﷺ had talked about the believers that their honor is sacred it should not be hurt that says their blood should not be spilled their, their wealth is haram on us also their honor is haram on us it is haram for us to attack the honor of our fellow Muslims but shaitan comes in and with what they call su adhan bad thoughts about people then these ideas start to develop and a person says something and somebody else carries that thing and then it goes from that into backbiting and slander and, and gossip mongering all of this is from shaitan all of it is from shaitan and this is one of the ways in which Iman is destroyed. We reach a point where people are breaking relations with other Muslims. Don't go to that masjid because they are deviants. But when you go into the masjid, the people are praying properly. And but these, these are from the wasawis of shaitan. Creating doubt. This is the major area. The second major area is beautifying the desires of and beautifying sin. A number of verses you'll find Allah saying something to the effect, كَذَلِكَ زُجِّنَ لِلْكَافِرِينَ مَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ In that way, for the disbelievers, what they were doing was made beautiful for them. They feel that what they're doing is beautiful, it's good. The beauty pageants, where women are standing and walking, naked in front of people and they're judging this is more beautiful than that it's beautiful you know, it's beautiful all of the, the corruption that they're involved in is beautiful it becomes beauty but in fact it is evil it's darkness but they can't see it Satan has made it appear beautiful and it's a big fitna for Muslims today living in this society that in which sin has become beautiful, has been beautified and made so attractive. You know, 
many of us end up falling into it one way or another. And one of the major ways in which we fall into it is with the television. The television. If we're able to keep it, you know, at bay in the world around us, we are engulfed by it with the television. I don't think we need to go into too much detail of that one. I think we all know well the beautified evil of the television. And music. Music. Music is made so beautiful. And it's everywhere. It's everywhere and it's affecting people. So much so, people, they don't realize it. It's like subtle, very subtle, subtly changing people's personalities and their minds. They don't know it. You know, there was a w- thing that they, they, they used to do in the past when they first were showing movies, earlier when they were showing movies, they tried an experiment where whilst a movie was being shown in the movie house, they would flash a Coca-Cola or popcorn. Right? Just flash. Whilst you're watching the movie, you don't see it. Because it's only one frame. And it's out. You don't even see it. But your mind records it. It's seen it. And they found, yes, when they did this, people would be sitting there watching the movie. I need to get a Coke. And they find they're going out, going to buy a Coke. Oh, I need to get some popcorn. They're going out. They, they found that they were able to manipulate people. That's why they banned it. And they banned it on television. Not allowed to do it. No, you got, whatever you're doing, you better show it right up front. <laughs> they didn't allow them to do it. Because it has that power. Subtly. And that's the same thing with the music. The music, of course, it's not bad. Music is wide open. And the music, people think, and I have seen some young people tell me, you know, if I don't listen to music, I can't study properly. It helps me to study. <laughs> they read that state. The point is that, and people say, you know, I listen to the music, I'm only listening to Bach and Beethoven, and it's not, it's not the bad music, it's the okay music. Symphony music. And they think that, you know, I'm not affected by it. But the point is that you see people who may normally, they're okay people in certain points. Then all of a sudden you hear, this man has done this in his home. He beat up his wife and he did this and he's drinking alcohol now or he's gone. What, how are you talking, brother? What happened to you? I don't know. He thought you started to do these things. Where did it come from? This music which is coming in, which is the Quran of Shaitan, which is coming into the ear. This is why they, they described the early companions and that when they were walking the street, they heard music, they would, they would stick their fingers in their ears to protect their because the mind, these things are going in and you don't realize it. It is going into the mind and in your subconscious it is building up and it's building up and it's building up. And then it subtly causes changes and you wonder where is these things coming from? You get this desire and these things to want to do these things or to, to think or to say these things. You wonder, where did this come from? This is the way in which they get to us. And, of course, uh, drinking alcohol and the sexual deviations, these are also things which have become very attractive in the society. I mean, look at the ads for alcohol. You know, how alcohol is sold on the television. Along with it is smoking, for example, cigarettes. How cigarettes are promoted. The Marlboro Man, you know, see this guy riding on his horse into the sunset, right? With his cowboy hat on and his jeans and his right. You know, this is the... That's what it's shown. Nobody told you that the Marlboro Man actually died about five years ago and his wife is suing Marlboro Company for killing him with cancer right? they didn't tell you this but he's still shown there riding off into the sunset given beautified this filth this evil smoking is beautified alcohol is beautified you know, the various containers that they put it in and how it's shown you, the guy is drinking when he's drinking what? a girl is coming putting her out you drink and the girl's going to come You know, all, all of this to beautify to make it attractive it's evil 
and of course, as I mentioned, the sexual deviations, etc. You know, there's no end of that, and our time is running out rapidly. Uh, the other, the third way, is that of discouragement from righteousness, where we are doing something or we want to do something which is righteous and we are discouraged shaitan will come at us in different ways and discourage us from that righteousness you know as the well known hadith the Prophet had said that when a person goes to sleep at night Satan ties three knots to the back of his head when he wakes and mentions Allah's name then one knot is untied when he goes and makes wudu another knot is untied when he prays the third knot and in the morning he will wake up invigorated and uh, good feeling good but if he doesn't get up doesn't make wudu doesn't make salah when he wakes up in the morning he will wake up lazy and his soul will be bad for that day another way that this righteousness is discouraged that is regards salah is through bid'ah Satan will come and try to promote bid'ah amongst us. Because for every bid'ah, every innovated act, a sunnah is killed. For every in innovation which is brought in, a sunnah is destroyed. So this is how the sunnah which we should be focusing on is lost and we end up in bid'ah which is not acceptable to Allah and displeasing to Allah. If he can't catch us with that, then he tries to get us to do major sins. And if he can't get us to do major sins, he will try to get us to do minor sins. And if he can't get us to do minor sins, then he'll get us busy with what is permissible. Sports, for example. We end up playing sports and getting into sports so much. Though it's permissible, in and of itself, people become so absorbed in it, their lives become so focused in it, that actually re required acts and that become left behind. They pray their prayers late and delay it and these kind of things because of these permissible things. Similarly, you, may, you will even find, besides this wasting of time, you may even find people so, get so involved in sports that they end up in murder. You know, in Turkey, you had some Muslim youths killed some Brits over a football game. And I read a story in, in Pakistan where this guy and his son were watching a cricket game between India and Pakistan. The son was rooting for India and the father was rooting for Pakistan. And when India won, the father became so mad, he bashed his son over the head and killed him. Though the thing initially was permissible, he got so much involved in it, that it ended up into major sin. And then of course, shaitan will come to us and just confuse us in, and give, creates doubts, and doubts though in, in terms of discouragement from righteousness, where for example, the brothers came here to collect money for the masjid in Holland. And we have money that we can give. But shaitan will come to us and say, oh, you need that money for so and so, you need that money for so and so. You don't, it's, it's, it'll take, you lose money, you know, you need this other money, you had these plans and discourage you. Though you may have initially had the thought, maybe I should give, shaitan will come in and undermine you, pull the rug out from under you, and you end up not giving. Fearing loss. But as the Prophet ﷺ said, that charity does not decrease wealth. And in the area of discouragement from uh, righteousness, over onto the opposite side, of course, there is uh, shaitan encouraging people to worship uh, Satan and his representatives amongst human beings. We have people like, for example, Sai Baba, Sai Baba in India, who has over a million people worshipping him, believing that he is God incarnate. You know, you have Sheikh Nazim al Kubrusi, right? whose representative is, uh, uh, what's his name, um, Kabbani, this, uh, Hisham Kabbani, there in the United States, who set up an organization which he calls the Supreme Council for Muslims in the United States. He set it up and made himself the head, 
And he's not representing Muslims in the United States at all. But the United States government loves him. In fact, he just recently had a meeting and, and declared, and it's on the internet, that he supports the Russians against the Chechnyans. Why? Because they're Wahhabis. You know, deviants. So he supports the Russian government. And what does Sheikh Nazim do? And he focuses on many of the converts in Europe and etc. Sheikh Nazim tells his, con- his followers, right, that if they believe in him, they accept him as their Sheikh, they become murid to him. He promises them that when the angel of death comes, he will be there to take their soul. Angel of death will not take their soul. He will take their soul and pass it on to the angels of the next life. And when Munkir and Nakir come to ask them the questions in the grave, he will be there whispering to them the answers. That's what he tells his followers. Lost. And this is among the ways in which shaitan, even within the guise of Islam and everything else, can come and deviate people to the point where they are opposed to the true teachings of Islam. Okay, I think our time is up. I'll just uh, close by saying that we defend or we our defense against Satan is fundamentally to strengthen our soul with faith that we spoke about in the the branches of faith in the earlier series of lectures. You know, to increase our consciousness of Allah, you know, establishing our prayer trying to be sincere in our worship, developing good moral character, you know, abandoning corruption in our life, and we develop a dislike and a distaste for falsehood and sin, and to be precautionary, to be very cautious in the different things that we do in the name of Islam, make sure that they're from the Quran and Sunnah, stick firmly to the Quran and the Sunnah, because in it is our guidance. And then of course, Prophet ﷺ has given us a variety of adhkar, dua, that we say to protect us from Satan. From the time we wake up in the morning to the time we go to bed at night. Even when we wake up in the middle of the night, Prophet ﷺ has given us du'as. Learn them. He didn't give it to us just so we could put it in books and we know it is there in books. No. He gave us this as a means of protection. So we need to make take advantage of it. This is our religion. It is complete. It guides and protects us at every moment. We need to take advantage of it. Inshallah, we'll stop here now for Salat al-Asr. After the Salah, uh, maybe for about 10 or 15 minutes, we'll give you a chance if you have some questions, you know, so we can finish off our topic on the destruction of Iman. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Can you salt it? The soap without water, I think it's not. Bismillah, inshallah, we'll stop here for salah. We'll make the adhan and uh, we'll continue after the salah.